I will be discussing about the applications of industrial waste. The <coughs> following are the subtopics, various applications of industrial waste or byproducts, particularly fly ash, which has been used since long, silica fumes, then rubber tires and glass as aggregate, which can be covered as a byproduct from the industries. Jute fiber, natural Jute fiber. fiber. Yes, okay. But we can use here GGPS, slag. Yeah, slag and GGBFS can also be used. And, uh, rice correct. husk ash. Rice husk ash, correct. Uh, sugar bagas. Bagas ash, bagas. ash. okay. The industry, uh, construction debris. The yes, construction debris can also be under this list, correct. And then uh, foundry sand after the foundry sand, yes. Then the road aggregate or road re uh, re recycled aggregates. Uh, aggregate uh, coming from the road. That's right. Reclaim. Okay. Anything else apart from this? Red mud, yes. Paper sludge. In the last lecture we have talked about paper. So there are so many, you know, materials which have to be utilized. And the common word nowadays or the most recent uh, terminology which is being used is valorization of industrial byproducts. Dredge material is also becoming a very big issue that how to utilize the material which is coming out of the dredging. And as I said, you know, in the previous lectures, that any nation which wants to develop or the economy of the country gets directly influenced by the dredging operations. You have to maintain your ports. So, this is where you have to do the maintenance dredging. You have to create new ports. And this is where you have to do capital dredging. All right. So, dredging has become a very interesting geo material. Uh, dredge material has become a very interesting geo material in today's context. And people are trying to devise different applications and modalities so that this material can be utilized. E-waste is also an industrial byproduct, but truly speaking, uh, normally E-waste is not used directly in any of the applications. Why? Because it is hazardous in nature. Why? Because uh, there are uh, many actually like diodes and capacitor they, uh, and regist uh, register, they actually contains uh, ceramic materials and uh, Different kind of uh, right. material that ceramics right. and another. What are the heavy metals which are present in electronic items? Lead, cadmium, zinc, nickel, soldering iron. So most of the PCBs which you use, they have all these leachable heavy metals. So these metals have a tendency to get leached, particularly lead, nickel, chromium. Arsenic is not the one which will come out of the e-waste. Sorry? Ah, volatile organic substances, VOCs, they might also come out of the industrial, uh, sorry, e-waste. Most of the time when you use the plastic tin, SN is also another element which is present in the soldering uh, systems. So, coming back to your point. Uh, E-waste is not being used directly as uh, you know construction material, unless you immobilize it. So, this is where there is a discussion going on between the people who are trying to valorize the industrial waste and the concrete technologist. The tendency of the people who are into valorization is to dump everything into the concrete. And this is where concrete technologists say, concrete is not a dump material, you know, you cannot dump anything and everything here we have to maintain its integrity, we have to maintain its strength, we have to maintain its rheology and other things. So, this is what the discussion is that how to utilize the industrial byproducts coming out of the electronic industries. The obvious answer would be resource recovery. That means, you send them to the factories or the units where heavy metals can be recovered. So, this becomes a recycling process. Generally, when we purchase those batteries, well, they say that do not dispose Nickel it. Nickel cadmium. Uh, do not dispose it as uh, by uh, breaking it or they ask us to uh, re, uh, what, uh, 
to give them back. So how much efficient is that we can uh, get back those uh, heavy metals which are once used the recycling? There are plants where either they have to be disposed of very carefully or you have to extract the metal out of it. These are the two ways. Unfortunately, in developing countries and the countries like you know ours, there is no special emphasis given on uh, segregation of the waste, everything goes into the landfills and it becomes a very chaotic situation. But in developed nations, normally they do segregation and people are quite educated enough to take care of the segregation at the source level itself. So, all those things we have to teach to our populace and we have to bring them you know at par with the international standards. Fine. Anything else apart from this? So, truly speaking these are the issues which are more conducive to uh, civil engineering practices. I have not included your red mud and GGBFS and other things because still a lot of research is going on and they will take some more time to get established as a resource material. Now, you remember the idea which I was trying to inculcate here is that the moment you talk about the applications, applications have to be decided based on uh, characterization. You have to understand the material. It is not that just I am going to dump something somewhere. That philosophy will not work in today's world. So, whenever the question comes what to do with this material, the obvious answer is try to understand what this material is and this is where the role of characterization becomes very, very important. So, when we talk about characterization for both the materials like the geomaterials like soils, rocks, groundwater and so on or the industrial byproducts or the waste material, fine. What is the philosophy of characterizing both of them? Why do you want to understand both these materials? It is just like marrying the two materials. You know, Indian practice is normally they will match horoscopes, is it not? Why? Compatibility. Now, this concept is actually valid when we talk about waste disposal as well. There is something known as receiver, the material which is receiving the entire waste. And this is where we use the term, you know, this is what is known as dampening effects. Suppose, if I discharge effluents on soil mass. Now, what soil should be doing? It has two roles to play. Either it will allow the entire sludge or the waste material to pass through it and let the entire thing go into the water table. This is the worst scenario. The better scenario would be that soil is intelligent enough to stop the migration of metals which are present in the industrial sludges from going and interacting with the ground water. Did you get the point? So, what as an engineer you are supposed to do? You are supposed to create intelligence in the system that it would not allow any sludge and heavy metal passing through it in such a way that ultimately all the metals go and become a part of the ground water. Now, this is what is known as engineered system. You have engineered it in such a manner that you are trying to derive whatever you wanted to derive from it or the way you wanted it to behave. Now, this is what the practice of environmental geomechanics is. So, clients will give you let us say parameters, design something so that this type of discharge will never going to in my underground petroleum tanks. Because if the sludge goes and interacts with the petroleum which I have stored underground, I am losing the commercial value of the petroleum clear or if I want to utilize the underground space and if contamination takes place again I cannot utilize it because I have to decontaminate it first. So, either way this is going to be a issue which requires enough amount of money and time and it has to be addressed separately you are getting the point. So, characterization is becoming very very important to understand the situations and to understand that how under a given situation or situations these type of systems are going to behave and this is where the soil contaminant interaction starts. Long back we were talking about soil contaminant interaction, rock contaminant interaction, is it not? Geomaterial contaminant interaction. So, this interaction has become a very interesting philosophy in today's world and most of us are trying to quantify 
this interaction. Is this part clear? So, the quantification can be done once you have understood what characteristics this material possess. So, this is a very scientific approach to understand how the two systems are going to react with each other or not react with each other to maintain a synergy. Is this part okay? So, the major issues for application of industrial waste as a geomaterial are the first thing is you have to identify the application. The same fly ash you know which is coming out of the thermal power plant might have different applications. So, the question is what type of application I am interested in. So, I have to now the question which you are asking Amit the answer comes out of this statement. Now, if I am trying to use a material as a pozzolanic material I will have a different test to be performed. But if I have decided that I am not going to use this material as a pozzolanic material the type of test which I will be doing are going to be totally different. But this is a million dollar question that how would you decide whether this material should be utilized as a pozzolanic material or not. So, in other words you have to perform few tests and eliminate applications which are not possible by using this material. So, this becomes a trial and error. The second thing is that you have to understand what are the key properties you are require you are expecting from this material to exhibit for that application. A pozzolanic material is understood that it should be forming a gel, it should be giving you strength clear. So, this connotation makes you understand that the material should be having enough of calcium oxide. So, the moment you said calcium oxide is too high or too low immediately I have two options in which I can utilize the material. The moment you say calcium oxide is very high it is going to be obviously a pozzolanic material. I should not be wasting this material in dumping and creating non pozzolanic system like filling of the landfills or filling of the backfills and so on. So, the key property required for the application has to be identified. Then comes the sustainability whether this solution which you are going to provide or whether the material which you are going to use is sustainable or not. Now, there is a ban to inject chemicals nowadays in the ground those days are over where people used to inject lime into the soil to stabilize the soil. Why? We have learned from our mistake and we know that the moment I am doing this I am contaminating the water table much more clear because ultimately everything is going to leach and because of that leaching sustainability may get affected. So, environment is the key word of the present day civilization sustainability is another key word. So, the idea is whatever applications you are looking for they should be sustainable environmentally they should not be damaging the environment under any circumstances. Now, once you have all these things set in your mind then you go for the laboratory tests these are also known as uh, laboratory protocols. So, when you do you know concrete tests for 7 days for 20, 14 days 28 days 56 days 112 days and so on it is nothing but you are creating a testing protocol in the laboratory is it not that the concrete should be following these type of norms and you will allow certain amount of standard deviation from the values which you get in the laboratory clear. So, you have to develop a, a protocol for laboratory tests once this has been done you might be requiring modeling tool. So, once you have the laboratory results with you you can develop models and models are normally developed for obtaining the engineering behavior of the material. So, Terzaghi's theory ultimately it gives you a mathematical model to find out how much consolidation will occur if you apply this much load. Truly speaking this is the behavior of the material which you are trying to estimate under application of mechanical stresses and this theory was given by Terzaghi. The same thing actually you have to do when you talk about the geo environmental issues there has to be a model which defines the hypothesis on which you are working and once this model is ready then you should be utilizing this model with the help of the laboratory results to obtain engineering behavior. So, suppose if I ask you to create a durable concrete 
it is understood that durable concrete can only be prepared by adding some admixtures into it. The next step follows that the whatever you are going to add to the concrete system should be sustainable to environment, it should not be corrosive. The next question in the reverse order would be what is this material which will show you enough pozzolanicity when added into the concrete, clear? This is what the application is. Another interesting issue is that you might devise something in the laboratory, you might create something in the laboratory, but if it is not feasible or acceptable to the field people, it is of no use. Most of the studies you will find in the papers they are you know 1 kg of fly ash is mixed with 1 kg of the soil and they have got the parameters. The question is in field how I am going to do this. So, truly speaking all these type of research gets defeated when it comes to the practical or the field level, where you cannot excavate the soil and mix it with the ash and replace it. Are you getting this point? So, a million dollar question is what is the constructability and the field performance of the philosophy which you are working on and the another issue is the long term performance which is durability. Even if you are doing ground modification by adding some chemicals into it, the aim is that this system should be sustainable, self sustainable for a pretty long time, say 100 years is the age which you are looking for any structure which is created out of soil, fine. You agree with this or not? So, during 100 years the chances of failure of the system should be as minimum as possible we call it as long term performance of the system. But the question is we have to devise tests and the methodologies which can give you long term response of the material. One of the good examples of this type of test would be corrosivity of soil. So, corrosion of the soil is going to actuate may be after few years or there could be a situation where the soils are so corrosive that they may eat up the metal immediately. So, many times we want to do accelerated corrosion tests. The whole idea is by doing this test I would like to get the response of the material which will be corresponding to 100 years of the real life, fine. In concrete technology all of you must have studied when we talk about long term performance there is known as something known as early gain in strength and delayed gain, gain in strength, is it not? you must have studied these two things. Why do you add pozzolana? Why do you add admixture to the concrete? You want to control whether you want early strength or you want prolonged strength. If you are doing structures in let us say offshore environment, what will be your objective? You want to gain strength 90 percent of the strength as soon as possible. The 10 percent which remains you can wait for few more years. Reverse is true for the systems which are not so conducive, which are not so uh, I would say non conducive. So, there I do not want any early strength immediately, I want the 100 percent strength to be achieved let us say after 1 month, 2 months, 3 months or 1 year, clear. So, this is how the philosophy of utilizing the material changes. Anything else which comes to your mind as far as long term performance concern? I have given you two examples, one is the concrete, cement, another one is the soils which are highly corrosive in nature. Anything apart from this which comes to your mind? Teaching can also be considered to be in long term. Large deflections this because of different type of loadings, particularly creep, particularly creep which we are not bothered much about you know in the conventional geomechanics, we normally ignore it. Yes, anything else? try to isolate it from the environment. Yeah, so, you are right uh, another good example of long term performance of uh, 
foundation systems would be uh, you are talking see remember i was discussing about mineralogical alteration of soils and rocks zeolite formation continuous contact of geomaterials with sea water where you have lot of chloride sulfates what it is going to do it is going to alter the mineralogy of the rock and soil itself so many times what happens is in conventional geotechnical you know practices we just talk about the spt value without realizing what is the state of the rock what about the mineralogy what about the petrography of the material it may so happen that you may get a very high spt value but this spt value may correspond to the zeolites which have got formed due to sea water interaction at high temperature of the soils and rock minerals and these zeolites are going to be detrimental now this process happens in nature so a good geotechnologist will go to the site take out samples will do e mu test crushing strain test load deformation characters everything but apart from this what he or she will do is he will or she will take out a sample make a thin sample put it below the microscope and see the mineralogical arrangement also and from there he or she will try to find out what rate of decomposition of the materials is going on because of this interaction so sometimes those of you may work a, get a chance to work in middle east particularly where the formations are mostly limestone and i'm sure that if you type on the net you can see the type of cavities which exist underground huge cavities because of dissolution of limestone as an interaction of sea water very high temperatures high humidity presence of limestone interaction with sea water creates dissolution of limestone and hence cavities get formed clear so this is another interesting long term performance today the foundation is resting on a sound deposit but tomorrow because of sea water interaction something of this sort may happen so this is where you know people are thinking of now mineralogical alteration also i hope now you must be getting a feel of you know the whole domain of geotechnical engineering has gone beyond a certain point until now you always thought that things are stationary rocks are rocks soils are soils we never bothered about their vulnerability good to get changed over a period of time micp is one of those <coughs> microbially induced calcite precipitation MICP long term performance of the system may get accelerated or decelerated depending upon what type of bacteria is harping in it a type of bacteria will like to eat up the entire soil mass particularly if it has more of nutrition carbon hydrogen nitrogen sulfur clear so in this case if the bacterial activity is very high bacterially induced decomposition of the soil mass of the rock mass will occur and imagine if the system is standing on the top of this type of a soil deposit or rock deposit where the bacterial activity is going to be very high it's going to be detrimental is this part clear so this is how the geotechnical engineering profession is now changing itself when people are thinking very loud and they are taking help from different different subjects to use their concepts in our concept building yes radiation can also be included in this because radiation also uh, degenerates the material so these type of studies have to be done are you convinced that why environmental geomechanics is required in today's world
No, actually I do not agree with your statement that as you would go deep down temperature increases, it depends again at the locations. Are you talking about the earth's mantle or you are talking about the offshore environment? Ah, then it is fine, because if you go to the offshore environment, you will find a very different phenomena. As you go deep down, what happens? Temperature becomes less, clear? And below the bottom surface of the seabed, if you go certain meters down, you may find tremendous drop in temperatures. These are the places where the gas hydrates are formed. Yes. Yes, I mean like lot of the whole thing is getting affected. The more and more methane which you are using as a fuel, the moment you extract it, what is happening? The formation of methane itself is because of disintegration of the soils, marine soils which are organic in nature and so on. So, once you are happy with these concepts, I hope you realize that there is importance of redefining the basics of conventional geomechanics. So, long term performance has become a very big issue and unfortunately there are not many tests and the devices which are already available where you can test the soil sample that what is going to happen after few years. Another good example is I think foundry you were talking about foundry sands and let me change the context. Uh, let us say the system where the soils are coming in contact with the heated elements, air conditioning ducts, heating ducts rocket launching pads all right your foundation for the furnaces where high temperatures are being exposed to the to the soil mass or the rock mass there could be thermally induced cracking there could be thermally induced mineralogical alteration of the material fine there could be thermally induced you know uh, capillary action I hope you understand what I am trying to say. The moment you have a furnace on the top of the soil mass, what will happen? The moisture migration will occur and the tendency of the soil is to lift the water from the ground water table. Now, unfortunately, these type of situations cannot be incorporated in your conventional geomechanics theories. You have any formula or any factor which you can use for the capillary action which gets induced because of the, you know capillarity which induces because of heating of the soil mass, but these are very practical problems. Very much uncertain. Where? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so it is good that you are asking at least how can we. So, the moment you ask this question, then you know somebody is going to answer this question. Yes, that is true. This is how the knowledge develops. That is right, correct, you are right. I have so no answer, but only thing I can say is that these are very pertinent questions. So, the Shashank is in UK right now and he is working on this type of problems bacterial induced instability in the soil mass. So, we are trying to change the entire concepts of the classical geomechanics the moment this type of activities happen in the soil mass. This is how the subjects and the knowledge grows. I am sure you must have got a feel that why the subject is growing every day. This part is clear. Sorry? Achha, nanotechnology. Okay. Yeah, you can create impermeable systems by adding these materials so that they become highly durable this would be the remedial action, but before coming to this stage I have to check what the material is, 
I have to check the durability, I have to talk about the long term performance and then only I have to give a prescription. What is not applicable? No, they are using all these fibers which people are using, nanomaterials which people are using. Silica fume is nothing but a nanomaterial. They are adding into soil, they are adding into concrete. Now, GGBFS is a nanomaterial which they are putting into the soil to increase its durability and strength. So, like the structures guy talk about the composites, we talk about geocomposites we talk about geopolymers. Polymers are normally talked about by chemical engineers or chemistry guys. PVCs, PVC is nothing but polymers, is it not? What we are doing? We are creating geopolymers, stable, durable system, highly stiff or flexible depending upon your requirement which you are creating out of the natural resources by adding something into it. So, these are the objectives of today's researchers, they want to create systems like this, so that they perform the way you wish them to perform. Is this clear? I hope now it must be clear to you that there is a lot of scope of doing research here, because everything is unknown. Yes, both acidic and basic both soils, bacteria can survive both the environments, aerobic, anaerobic both, bacteria can survive even the lava temperature also, you know it is a very funny thing, all of us will disappear, but not the bacteria, I hope you must have heard this. So, it is a very interesting thing to handle, so these type of discussions we never had earlier in our subject. Now, people are realizing this is soil without bacterial action is incomplete. So, what you are trying to deal with is hardly 50 percent of the or 60 percent of the characteristics to deal with, 40 percent you are ignoring or more than that you are ignoring. Any property, property is a property. See all these engineering properties and physical properties, they are all interlinked. This is what I am going to discuss now. Many times when you go to the doctors, you say, I do not know what happens to me sometimes. Then what doctor does? He or she asks you a lot of questions. No, they take time to understand, diagnose your problems. So, there is a preliminary diagnosis done by talking to you. Then what is the next stage? He is ruling out, she is ruling out few experiment, few tests and then three, four tests are recommended. Please go through this first, give me the reports and then I will tell you what is that you require. Strategy creation. So, the, the moment you talk about all these things, there has to be a strategy. do not use the word difficult, they are intriguing, it's nothing is difficult in the world, is it not? It is intriguing which keeps you occupied and you want to master it, that urge comes that oh I want to understand what is happening, that is it. Only human beings have done everything. Correct. 
Yeah, so one of the things which can be implemented immediately in most of the geotechnical engineering curriculums and the laboratories is the moment you take out a sample from the field, you do all the tests, but please also perform biotechnological tests to establish what is the inherent capacity of the soil as far as retention of bacteria is concerned or what type of environment this soil gives to the bacteria to grow or not to grow. So, this test has become now mandatory whenever you do the tests which are of national uh, sorry projects which are of importance you know they are uh, we call them as uh, NRB, SRB nitrate reducing bacteria, sulphate reducing bacteria these type of tests are becoming mandatory pipelines particularly you cannot take a chance to dig a pit put the pipeline there and let this pipeline get eaten up by bacterial action it will be a big national wastage. So, under these circumstances the soil corrosivity has become a very big parameter which all the geotechnical engineers are supposed to learn and when you talk about soil corrosivity one of the aspects is bacterial activity. You see our profession is now just on the verge of adopting these concepts piles for that matter I will show you some examples that the entire piles have been eaten up by different type of creatures fine and they failed why they were designed by using the best possible practices available in geotechnical engineering the best possible investigations but ultimately things failed the question is why and it is not divine nothing is divine here that see this God's grace this has happened no it is your ignorance you did not study that parameter which has become so prominent. So, the soil investigation geotechnical examination is now bound to change and that is what you know academicians and professionals are trying to work on. So, I think another 3, 4, 5 years you will see that uh, bacterial count will become a basic experiments in geotechnical engineering. This will be a mandatory thing fine yeah. Well, that is the more severity nothing else or I do not know whether the dynamic load is more severe or the static load is more severe in your in your opinion. Correct. So, truly speaking earthquake lo earth earthquake forces are also trying to change the pore water pressure regime clear now pore water pressure regime itself is going to be changed by the bacterial activity for that matter. So, the issue is unless you understand what is going to happen in day to day life these forces are external forces body forces earthquake forces external loading and so on you must have seen most of the analysis what do we do we just use some factor multiplied by the acceleration in the x direction y direction z direction we superimpose it nothing else. So, you keep on superimposing the effects and you get the right answer answer means what you wanted to achieve, but the question is what is happening to the material inherently has not been answered and cannot be answered unless you utilize these concepts. In my opinion static loading is much more severe than dynamic loading. Why? Static loading is more dangerous than the dynamic loading. Think about it. You have to prove me either right or wrong. What is the meaning of dynamic load? That is a layman's language ultimately where this gets delegated in the soil particles. Any load which you apply has to be getting has to be delegated in the form of the pore water pressures. 
So, the only difference is your u becomes a function of time and amplitude nothing else what else. So, at fundamental level all your external loads get delegated in the form of the pore of pressures. So, your dynamic loading is nothing but the response of the pore of pressure over a period of time implement in your system and compute sigma prime as a function of time that is it. When you have computed sigma prime as a function of time shear strength as a function of time can be obtained that is it this is what your dynamic analysis is. Have you understood this? I have given you the whole idea about what is dynamic analysis. You forget about any external load I am saying do not consider any load you first talk about what type of micro porous structure is going to get developed because of this activity that is more important. Forget about what is going to happen external first of all I want to understand whether this system itself is so critical for the stability of the soil mass or not. If the system itself is so critical about the stability of the soil mass it need not to wait for an earthquake to come and strike it is going to collapse automatically under the self weight itself go to the natural deposits and you will find that most of the natural deposits are failing why because of the microbial action decay. So, today's geotechnical engineers are talking about soil environment interaction why influence of environment on geomaterials that has become a very big issue. So, first you understand the geomaterial itself impact of environment on this and then try to use your dynamic static analysis those are tools. Are you convinced? Not insects anyway let us talk about bacteria only yes or pathogens. Okay. burrows yes cavity formation ok. Then water may insert may get you know ingressed into that and it may harm the foundation that is right. So, so, why do you why do you create aprons in the vicinity of the buildings why you must have noticed in your hostels also there will be an apron of one one and a half meter wide what is the application of this apron? Nothing should influence the foundations including the seepage water clear that is why they protect extra protection they provide to the foundation system and soil even if gets eroded there should not be any connectivity of the eroded soil forming a gully in the foundation and the environment your foundations will get directly exposed to the environment. So, this is a sort of a protection system which is adopted. Okay. Yes. See, that is what MICP is. That is what MICP is. Once something precipitates in the pore structure or pore space, your soil mass is becoming impervious. But then you have to investigate it. In what type of soils, under what type of circumstances, MICP will occur or not? alteration in the pore structure will occur or not, decay of the soil will occur or not. So, all these things have to be studied. There is no one common answer that what will happen to this material. So, what he was discussing and what I was trying to answer to him is first consider the material, then comes the external loading. Is this fine okay? correct. In other words the pore structure changes with respect to time. Some time back when I was talking to you I, I told you tau as a function of time, sigma prime as a function of time, pore pressure as a function of time, 
Now, what you are including into this is pore structure as a function of time. That is it, model it. It answers all your questions. Got the point? For how there is an answer, then you have to study it. Clear? With the moment how comes, study starts. <laughs> you agree? So, the moment you ask a question how it happens, whether it will happen or not, you are free to study it. What laboratory protocols you are talking about? The protocols which are incomplete and incorrect. So, please do not do this mistake, you have to create new protocols, fully realizing the fact that whatever protocols you are using are incorrect, are incomplete. See, that is what the difference is. When I was talking to you some time back, what is the difference between engineering and technology? So, if you are still talking about you know what used to happen in 15th century, 17th century, then it is a different game altogether. But when you are trying to go ahead with time and you say, okay, we have studied this, we realize that these are the issues which have which need to be answered, addressed, what should be done, how it should be done to achieve this futuristic technology development. So, you remember what, what we are discussing here is soil technology, we are not talking about soil engineering. The techniques which might be used to create something which is going to be more stable, more useful for the human beings and so on. In this series, the last one is regulatory constraints. I think somebody was talking about validation and you were talking about the laboratory protocols and all. So, whatever you are doing, you know, the basic issue is you have to follow regulatory constraints in terms of contamination, in terms of deformation, in terms of loads, in terms of concentration counts and everything. Clear? So, this is the whole matrix, these are the issues which are normally uh, kept in mind when you are trying to utilize any material for creating a composite. At the end of the day, People do not understand 90 percent that in this house which you are sitting, what type of concrete has been used to create wall. And hardly 1 percent guys who will be knowing, oh this place is peculiar. Out of that 1 percent only, maybe point not 1 percent will be the guys who will be knowing what type of material has been used to create this type of system. Out of that point not not 1 percent, people might have invented that material to create something. So, this is how it is an inverted prism. For 95 percent people, this is only the auditorium, rooms are good, you know very cozy place, nice, good. So, few people are taking care of the requirements of the entire population, that philosophy is correct. Okay, now, let me talk about a bit of pozzolana, all of you are aware of it, I am sure. Pozzolana is something which is self setting, is it not? The moment you add drop of water on a powder and if it sets, hardens, we call it as a pozzolanic material. There is a name or there is a place in Italy known as Pozzoli. Most of this land was created by volcanic eruptions. The soil is hyperactive. The moment water drops there, everything gets solidified. The best possible cementitious material which nature has given you. You need not to create any cement there. Fine. What is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is that any material which has this characteristics that when it comes in contact with water, it solidifies, forms a gel. It is known as a pozzolanic material. Cement is one of the pozzolanic materials. In North India and some parts of the country in India, people use surki. What is surki? I hope you understand what is surki. You take lime, a bit of ash, mix it together, it is nothing but a geopolymer. This was used by Roman guys, you know, 2000 years back, 3000 years back. There is nothing new about it. Green cement, green technology, green chemistry, alkali aggregate interaction. You study in your transportation engineering course and the construction management course, I am sure. What do you try to find out? You take some alkali and put an aggregate there. What is that you are trying to study? So, is this a good thing? Suppose, if you get a big volume change, 
it's a, it's a welcome sign or it's not a welcome sign why soundness correct you use the word soundness immediately that means alkali aggregate reaction should give you a sound material the volumetric deformation should not be much because of the exchange of the ions from the alkali into the aggregate why if alkali aggregate reaction is going to be quite pronounced what will happen to the concrete all these calcium ions which are present in the cement they will be eaten up by the aggregates and you won't have any calcium ions for formation of the gel which is required for creation of good concrete it's a reverse mechanism which is going to happen you got the point calcium ions are not free to get to form a good gel to give you a strengthful concrete alkali has a tendency to absorb all the calcium ions and contain it within themselves it's a reverse reaction which is going on it's not a welcome sign so whenever you work as a geotechnical engineer civil engineer you always try to establish the reactivity of a material with the environment what is the environment water contaminated water acidulated water basic water and so on and you want to see that your system remains volumetrically stable it should not crack it should not deform it should not swell clear so this is a geopolymer so surkhi is nothing but a normal construction practice you take some lime put it in the ash mix it and then this can be used as the plaster or a lean concrete in villages is it not they use it now consider these two situations here i am showing you one natural volcano the lava is coming out of the volcano there is a eruption of the volcano recently there was a volcanic eruption where they are cut off from the world anyway go and check it so this is a natural volcanic situation all right the ash which goes out of the volcano ultimately gets deposited somewhere and this ash is something which is coming out of the modern thermal plants so there is a similarity between the two what is the similarity between the two the end material is same one is man made system another one is a natural system so the fly ash which comes out of the industrial units like thermal power plants and all is nothing but a pozzolanic material now degree of polar pozzolanicity may change from one place to another place depending upon how much calcium you have what is the percent percentage of silica alumina and so on so i am sure that you must have come across stabilization of soils by using fly ash you must have studied lot of laboratory studies have been done lot of in situ studies have been done for improvement of the base cores and sub bases of the pavements have you ever done some studies on this type of concepts have you come across this the best possible example is in calcutta you know from calcutta to kharagpur when you go most of the sub bases are being done with the help of your kola ghat fly ash have you ever seen it you just get out of your car or vehicle and just see what they are doing so they are dumping all the coal ash to create embankments and the pavements directly people have shown that uh, by application of the fly ash the soil pressure can be reduced and the percentage swell of the soil decreases why fly fly ash is please forget about this statement now hence forth fly ash cannot be inactive fly ash is active particularly if it has calcium in it or even by virtue of very fine particles which it has it's a active material so you have to define whether it is chemically active or chemically inert or whether it is physically active or physically inert or whether it is mineralogically active or mineralogically inert you got the point now why soil pressure decreases because fly ash contains some calcium into it these calcium ions leach out they are retained by the soil particles this property of the soil is known as attenuation soil attenuation now soil attenuation what it does it retains the calcium ion onto itself the moment calcium ions come and 
in contact with the soil particles, there is a sort of a cementitious effect which happens and hence the swelling decreases. Another reason is the fly ash particles which are quite fine in nature, they are replacing the fine particles of the soil and hence soil is changing from pure clay to a sort of a silty clay and hence the percentage swell changes. So, one is a chemical stabilization, another one is a physical stabilization. Why physical? Only the particles replacing the clay particles physical phenomena. Calcium from a material sticking on other particles is a chemical phenomena. Most of the time it will be a physical chemical interaction which is going to occur in the materials when we talk about stabilization. Is this part clear? The studies which have been conducted they show that liquid limit, plastic limit, plasticity index will decrease. The logic is same, you are replacing the fine particles with the help of the silty particles or sandy particles. So, plasticity modification can be done and hence you can achieve better compaction, like clays cannot be compacted, but once you use fly ash in combination with the clays or part replacement of clays, then you can compact this material very well. You can control the permeability, you can control the degree of swell, you can control the consolidation characteristics, you can control the shear strength and so on. CBR modification and this is the point which leads to their application as a pavement material. In clay CBR is very poor, why? either because of water logging or because of less shear strength which are related to each other. The moment you add fly ash into it, what happens? The percentage of fines decreases clear and because of the replacement of the fine, the strength is also going to increase because water will not get stagnant over there. So, permeability increases. When permeability increases, the compressibility will decrease the shear strength will be more, density will be more. People are using fly ash cement mix together, part replacement of the fly ash in the cement, they are trying to create, uh, normally we use the term OPC, ordinary Portland cement, but the moment you amend it by adding some of the fly ash, it becomes PPC. What is PPC? Yeah, it's basically a pozzolanic Portland cement, correct. So, because you are adding some pozzolana into it, why pozzolana is added? To regulate the strength formation. We were talking about some time back early strength gain and prolonged strength gain. So, fly ash actually in cement would regulate the strength formation. Now, as a, geo, as a civil engineer, you can utilize this material depending upon what your construction site is and PPC will always give you resistance towards chemical attack. So, the environments which are going to be extremely non-conducive for construction like offshore marine environment where you have a lot of chlorides, sulphates and so on. PPC is going to perform better than OPC, durability is going to be more. Now, why are you saying all these things? Because the moment you look into the microstructure of these materials, you will realize that these type of state of the material exists and this will be talking about later on. For your information, fly ash has already been used quite a lot in the country and everywhere in the world, uh, fly ash is being utilized tremendously. Even the Hiranani building right across IIT campus, they are the they were the first in the country to use fly ash up to the tune of 35 to 36 percent as a replacement for cement. And now I think is doing is being done everywhere. Most of the projects they are using PPC. Portland Pozzolana cement, 
they blend the cement with some pozzolana. It's a process. Then there is a high level of acceptance among consultants, architects, and engineers because of the added properties like durability. There is a IS code also, which says that up to 35 percent of the cement can be replaced by pozzolanic material. The pozzolanic material could be rice ash, cash, fly ash, but not the silica fume. Silica fume has to be added in small dose, 3 to 4 percent. IS 456 to 2000 talks about this. And once you are reducing the consumption of OPC, basically you are conserving the environment. Why? Less production of cement, less carbon dioxide ejection into the environment. Basically, carbon footprints can be earned. Production of more and more cement is against environmental safeguarding activities. Then there is a concept of high volume fly ash concrete. Have you come across this HVAC for infrastructure development? Self compacting concrete. You must have come across, is it not? What is self compacting concrete? In layman's language, how would you define what it is? You add some admixtures in the concrete, which will make it more dense. That is it. So, the whole funda is that I am trying to fill in the micro voids, which are present in the voids in the, in the concrete by external materials, admixtures, fly ash or silica fume. These particles are nanoparticles. They go and plug the micro pores. The moment they plug the micro pores, system becomes durable, density increases. Yeah. So, most of the time when we talk about high volume fly ash concrete, HVAC, the connotation is self compacting concrete. These are also known as high volumes of fly ash concretes. High volume of fly ash is utilized in concrete creation. The beauty is that W by C ratio can be maximized because the moment you are replacing this material by cement or for cement, your W by C ratio changes. So, in concrete technology you must have observed that the strength itself is a function of W by C. Everybody is trying to use less cement. It can be done in two ways. Your W by C ratio, if you want to maintain same, if you are using the same amount of cement you have to reduce the water also accordingly, but the problem is the moment you reduce the water you cannot mix the cement to make concrete. So, people are trying to work on a system where the cement can be minimized, water cement ratio can be minimized. Yeah. Super plasticizers you can add correct. So, super plasticizers are the ones who which give you more rheological properties to concrete, more workability. That is right. Basically, the application of concrete, sorry, application of the cement in the concrete is going to be extremely less. So, if you can minimize the application of uh, cement in the concrete, this is going to be the best possible sustainable solution. Where are the applications? Most of the applications would be in uh, infrastructures, which are going to be of extreme importance. In power sector, mostly they use it or even transportation infrastructure also. Most of the hydro, thermal, nuclear power plants, you know, where you cannot afford any porosity in the concrete, atomic shells or the reactor shells, which you create, you know, if the system is porous what will happen? The radiations may come out of the concrete. So, this is the place where you want to use HVAC, where nothing can escape through the concrete matrix, including the fumes and vice versa. Outside fumes cannot penetrate into the concrete and hence durability of the system remains maintained. Are you aware that in some of the concrete they add lead balls also? 
they dope concrete with lead. Why? Particularly in atomic industry, when you are constructing the reactor building to give extra safety, lead is famous for retarding the radiations, nothing will penetrate through it. So, what they do? When the casting of the concrete is going on for the reactor, they dope the concrete with lead balls. Density increases, system becomes very compact and radiations cannot come out of it. So, you are basically creating a system which is highly durable, fine. So, all these practices are very common. Sometimes, when you are creating dams, barrages, irrigation projects where water is a very precious thing you want to contain the full amount of water, there should not be any percolation losses, there should not be any seepage losses. What would you do? You will use a PPC to plug the voids which are present in the foundations, so that the water can be stored forever. Yes, yes you are right, I was just coming to that, yes you can very good you can use this material for grouting also, cut and grouting particularly. Sometime back when we were talking about the plume of the industrial waste, you know flowing in the direction of the ground water and there I had put some barriers and I was talking about cut and walls. So, you can cut the ground and very thin sheets of the you know uh, cement, lean cement paste can be inserted and this lean cement paste will create a sort of a curtain which is a very cheap solution and very durable solution for creating a curtain grouts. So, curtain grouts are mostly created along the foundations of the earthen dams to elongate the seepage lines and uh, you can nullify the exit gradients. I hope you are aware of all this. So, nowadays whatever grouting is being done, uh, people are against chemical grouting nobody wants to contaminate the geo environment by putting chemicals into it. And this is where all these sustainable materials are being used. So, Pratyusha is working on this topic, she is trying to find, I think I have discussed about the bentonite, bentonite's fundamental properties are very different. Bentonite is a clay, it would not have any cementitious properties, but then applications are totally different. I want to create a curtain through which nothing should percolate, clear. So, bentonite slurry can only be used for temporary retention of let us say sheet piles. So, normal practice is the moment you install a sheet pile, you, you fill the voids which have been created with the help of a bentonite slurry. What it does? It goes and fills in the voids which have been created because of the piling action and makes the system monolith, but it is not giving any strength, please remember. So, the moment you want something where the microstructure of the system should be not allowing anything to leak out, including the fumes or the gases, then this type of pozzolanic materials become very handy. So, these are two different things altogether. One is when you are talking about the bentonite they give you temporary support for the voids to fill. When you are talking about HVAC, fly ash particles, durable materials, they are mostly used for enhancing the strength of the system and durable microstructure. These are two different things altogether. Unfortunately, it is not a permanent solution. I do not know whether you are aware or not the swelling and shrinkage properties of the soils also are not permanent, they are function of time. So, 10 cycles of wetting and drying what will happen? Soil become inert. So, we do not take chance of putting bentonite in such type of projects, clear, because everything has the activity because of the leachability of the ions. A day will come when all the ions will leach out of the system and then your bentonite will become a inert material, clear. So, this is what is done in marine projects, particularly when you are working in the underwater construction, underwater concreting, where you require quick setting of the concrete. 
So, your setting time should be very very short clear. So, there I have to select a concrete or a cement rapid hardening or delayed hardening. So, you can put always calcium chloride or some sorts of what you call it as retarders retarding agents is it not to set the setting time. Now, these type of materials will be very useful for that they set fast and they gain strength slowly. So, particularly in offshore environment these type of cements and concretes are in great demand. Another good application would be contaminated soils, where the soils are heavily contaminated with acids and you want to lay the foundations. Normal OPC is not going to be much of use. The best thing would be you use PPC clear it has a sulphate resistant property embedded into it and then the moment you use this material a system becomes more durable and sustainable. So, these are the applications of uh, you know micro materials which we are talking about these days. Several environmental and geo environmental engineering projects also require you know the fly ash applications particularly grout retaining walls, uh, curtain grouting and so on. Concrete yes there you have to use because they are resistant to the chemicals fly ash bricks they have been using since long for low cost housing tiles blocks bricks and so on. <coughs> 